this is episode 28 of Revelation chapter 16. So this is a recap of what we've done before. You can pause it at this point and just read this uh, quickly. So we've done Revelation chapter 4, 5, Daniel 9, and Revelation 6. If you can pause this page and read it if you want to recap on Revelation 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11, which is the seventh trumpet. And you can have a recap and, and uh, pause at this point and read this for chapter 12, 13, 14, and 15. And this is, we're now on chapter 16. Chapter 15, one of the four living creatures gives seven bowls containing seven plagues to seven angels, and that's where we start. So this is where you are now. The last trumpet has sounded, and you are here. We're about to go through the seven bowls. Verse 1. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. So the first bowl, loathsome sores. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome saw came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image so this reminds us of Exodus 9 where the sixth plague of Egypt God told Moses to take ashes from a furnace and scatter them to the heavens and the fine dust would cause boils to break out on all Egyptians and their beasts including Pharaoh's magicians so once God has figured out a method he'll do it again and again so these sores are an outward sign of inward corruption. Over and over, God has warned man not to worship false images. And these people have the mark of the beast stamped on their bodies like a cattle branding. And today we see devil worship even in the house of God. And false preachers are allowing and colluding with sin in their chapels and churches. And here's an occult witchcraft meeting with an upside down cross. So there's so many scandals in the church that people are becoming desensitized to it and that's the real tragedy. Sin is becoming normalized. Sin is normalized actually. Second bowl. The sea turns to blood. Verse 3. Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea and it became blood as of a dead man and every living creature in the sea died. Again reminds us of the plagues of Egypt. Exodus 7, this reminds us of the first plague of Egypt, where Moses lifted his rod and struck the Nile, and the waters turned to blood. So this second bowl is not an ecological disaster. This is God's wrath poured out on mankind. And look, at the desert, look at these people in the distance, how much dead animals, sea animals. This is in the UK, they had a storm, and all of these animals washed up on the shore. So can you imagine when the sea turns to blood, and the sea covers, what, 75% of our, uh, of our planet? Imagine the horror on the beaches. So the third bowl, the waters turned to blood. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard, heard the angel of the water saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things. Verse 6, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. So look at the irony of this plague. These wicked demonic men that worship Satan and the, the Antichrist have gleefully taken the blood of the saints. They murdered them, and now God gives them only blood to drink. So look at the irony of that. And here's the Nile that turned to blood. Verse 7. And I heard another voice from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Note that heaven hammers away at this point, that God is justified, that the Lamb is worthy. There is never even a hint that the punishment does not fit the crime. You take out my saints, I'll give you blood to drink. Fourth bowl. Men are scorched. Verse 8. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given him to scorch men with fire. Don't forget the Egyptian pharaohs worshipped Ra, the sun god. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. 
So here God is showing them who is actually the God of the sun. They think it's raw. Uh-uh. No. So, and, but they know now it's not. And that's why they blaspheme the name of God. Because they realize that God has power over these plagues. And they do not repent and give him glory. It's astonishing that these earth dwellers never repent. Sun worship was the earliest form of paganism, originating on the plains of Shinar in Babylon, modern Iraq. Nimrod, an Assyrian and the first world dictator, built his Tower of Babel in Babylon, the city that he founded, with the intention that its top reach into the heavens, in defiance of God who told him all to spread out and fill the earth. Joseph writes of Nimrod, Nimrod persuaded mankind not to ascribe their happiness to God, but that Nimrod's own excellency was the source of their happiness. And so don't ascribe it to God. The Nimrod, I'm it. And he soon changed things like any good dictator. He soon changed things into a tyranny, thinking there was no other way to wean men from the fear of God than by making them rely upon his own power. Nimrod is spoken of as a great hunter, except that he enjoyed hunting men and shedding their blood. So the first world order dictator was an Assyrian, and we suspect that the final one world dictator will also be an Assyrian. Micah 5 says, prophesying on the judgment of Israel's enemies, when the Assyrian comes into our land and when he treads in our palaces, then we will raise against him seven shepherds and eight princely men. They shall waste with the sword the land of Assyria and the land of Nimrod at its entrances. Thus he, God, shall deliver us from the Assyrian when he comes into our land and when he treads within our borders. First world dictator, last world dictator. Fifth bowl, darkness and pain. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and his kingdom became full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. So the ninth plague again. And God uses these plagues over and over. And the ninth plague in Egypt was darkness. And now this plague, the fifth bowl, is darkness. Remember, Adam sinned and thereby gave dominion of earth to Satan. So earth became the kingdom of Satan and the throne of the beast. So he poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and his kingdom. So this is not just actual darkness, though that is too. It's also spiritual darkness when you are separated from God. And then you kind of look like that. So verse 11, they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and did not repent of their deeds. So they blaspheme and they don't repent. Again and again, they refuse to repent. Things get worse and worse and more and more punishing, yet the earth dwellers just get angrier and angrier and more and more stubborn. And this is happening because of their deeds, but they deny any accountability. They refuse to take responsibility for their actions, which is worshipping Satan. Remember three chapters back, we're in chapter 16 now, three chapters back in Revelation 13, when they were adoring the beast and they were worshipping the beast, saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? The answer is God. God is able to make war on the beast. Sixth bowl, Euphrates dried up. Verse 12. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up, so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. So the Euphrates is a huge river, kind of like the Mississippi. It's over a mile wide in places, and it's usually 10 to 40 feet deep. Historically, it has always been a formidable boundary between the peoples of the east and those of the west. And the Roman Empire did not cross the Euphrates. They never got across to conquer the east. And they lived in cautious fear of those eastern nations like the Persian Empire. So here is the Gulf, the Persian Gulf, and here is the river Euphrates going all the way up into Turkey. And it's very broad. And back in the day, you couldn't get across it. So if you, 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 if you, had to, if you wanted to get to Israel, and this is an itty-bitty little piece of Israel. Now remember Israel, God said Israel had all the way from the uh, uh, Mediterranean across to the Euphrates. So God actually gave all of this, probably this, this piece as well. All of that is what God gave to Israel. But David only ever managed to conquer this little piece of Canaan and Solomon kept it and then it started breaking apart once the Assyrians got involved. 
So this entire piece of land should have, should be Israel, and yet it's not. And um, so this river Euphrates has been a barrier that has been difficult for them to cross in the past. So Persia, uh, Iran, modern Iran, some of Iraq, some of Turkey, some of Syria, they all couldn't get across. You couldn't get across here because of the Persian Gulf. Here's all the stands. Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Afghanistan, they couldn't get across either because this is the land bridge. And of course, Russia, when Russia comes, if you want to get your tanks, you've got to have a dry Euphrates. So now that the six bowl and the Euphrates has dried up, uh, it's it's a problem now because the, 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 the armies can mass themselves against Israel. This itty bitty teeny little country here. Verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So here we have our evil trinity, Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. And these three demonic forces convinced the world to go to war against Israel. They couldn't mass their armies before because of the Euphrates, but now that it has dried up, they can cross. But just as God opening the Red Sea proved a trap, which led to the destruction of the pursuing Egyptian army. So the drying of the Euphrates is another trap set by God to obliterate Israel's enemies. And the armies of the east will take the bait and fall into God's trap. For they are spirits of demons performing signs, which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Frogs are noisy creatures, plus they live in the mud or under rotting vegetation. These demon frogs, they're really just demons, creep and croak and their noise fills the ears of nations. These unclean spirits are loosed to deceive the kings and governments of the earth to join in this military expedition to overrun Israel, which proves to be the most disastrous expedition ever undertaken. In 1 Timothy, Paul tells us that in the last days, now the spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. So they have no empathy, no sympathy. Their consciences have been seared. Verse 15. Behold, I, Jesus, am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. So Jesus gives this last, final, absolutely no more, ultimate, this is the last one, closing, terminating warning. I come as a thief in the night, be prepared. So if Jesus is still warning the people, then there must still be a tiny, tiny band of people that have somehow managed to survive the seven seals and the seven trumpets and the seven bowls. And they've still not taken the cattle branding of the Antichrist mark and still not bowed to his image. These are hardy men and women. So Jesus reassures this tiny remnant to hang in there. Blessed is he who watches. And he will come again unexpectedly. So these must be people that are hiding out in the mountains, hiding in caves, deep in the forest, deep in the Amazon forest. Uh, there, there's got to be, if, give, if Jesus is giving his final warning, there has to be a few people. But we don't really know. But I would think there would be people hiding in caves and stuff. 16. And they, the nations of the world, gathered them together to a place called in Hebrew, Armageddon. And the seventh bowl, the earth utterly shaken. Verse 17. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. And this reminds us of Jesus on the cross. When he had finally completed his mission on earth, and he was up on the cross and he was dying, his final words were, it is finished. And then he died. Or as the Bible says, he gave up his spirit. So here, the seventh bowl from the seventh angel, it is done. And notice that the seventh bowl was poured out into the air. So the first manifestations of this bowl are in the heavens. They are cosmic convulsions. Isaiah 13 says, therefore I will shake the heavens and the earth will move out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings. 
there was a great earthquake. Like Jesus, when he was on the cross, all of this happened. Such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. No city in all the world escapes God's wrath. Haggai 2 reminds us, for thus says the Lord of hosts, once more I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 19. Now the great city, Jerusalem, was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So Rome falls, Paris falls, New York, London, Beijing, Moscow, Beirut, Belgium, all the cities of the nations of the world fall. Verse 20, then every island fled away and the mountains were not found. So this is interesting. This is understood in the modern times today where we have tectonic plates that slide around on top of the, the molten below. So the tectonic plates will shudder and slide and islands will slither across the face of the earth. So that's why the islands fled away and the mountains would collapse. So I was wondering if this is when the Mount of Olives splits and moves apart. Remember it says when Jesus comes again, he'll have one foot on the one side and one foot on the other side of the Mount of Olives. And this could be when these te tectonic plates shudder and slide. Maybe that's when the Mount of Olives splits, but we don't know. Verse 21, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent, which is about 100 to 130 pounds. Men blasphemed God. Yeah, they do it again. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. So the penalty for blaspheming was stoning. And what's God doing here? He's stoning the blasphemers. Now, these are about 60-pound balls, and in the, back in the day, the, uh, the catapult that the Romans used, when they put these balls in there and they pounded away at a, at a city wall, they could break a hole right through the wall. And don't forget, back in this day, these walls were 20 foot thick. They weren't one brick thick like we build today. These walls were 20 foot thick. And so these things would hammer away and hammer away and hammer away at a spot until finally they would break right through a 20-foot wall. So to be uh, for this great hail, which are 100 to 130 pounds. Uh, it, I mean, look at this hail blob that's fallen on this car. It's just astonishing. The, I, got, I got caught in a hail storm one time and this, the hail was about the size of tennis balls and I was running for shelter. And in that time, I got hit by a couple of those balls of, of hail and my whole body, all my muscles seized up like I was, uh, it was amazing. I couldn't move my arms or my back or anything. I had to get injections into my muscles to release them because the, the shock of the, of the tennis balls of hail hitting me. I was running like this guy and it was hitting my back as, as I was running for, for shelter. So when these things are this size, man... Okay, it appears that judgment cannot produce repentance. And preaching hellfire and brimstone doesn't bring people to Christ. Although people must be made aware that without salvation, they get hellfire and brimstone as a consequence. What draws people to God is his grace and mercy. God changes hearts through his love. Grace and mercy are actually opposites. So mercy like you get from a judge is not getting what you deserve. And grace, like you get from God, is getting what you don't deserve. And like Moses was drawn to God by a burning bush that was not being consumed, he was puzzled enough to go and check it out. So the bush was a thorn bush, symbolizing sin, and fire is a symbol of judgment. And the fact that the bush was not consumed is a symbol of God's grace and mercy. Grace attracted Moses, not God's judgment. So here's the seven bowls as we'll whip through them again. We got the sores that, took, uh, that affected all of those that had the mark of the beast. The sea turns to blood. All the creatures die. The rivers turn to blood. Nothing to drink. Mankind is scorched by the sun. And what do they do? They blaspheme God. The beast seat of government is afflicted. The Euphrates is dried up and the world armies gather to Armageddon. And the earth is utterly shaken. And if you've ever seen a terrier dog grab a cloth or a 
dog, a, a ball or something, or a bone and shake it. I mean, that, that's quite. That's how I see this. The earth is utterly shaken. So before the next session, if you've got the time, try and find 30 minutes to read Revelation 17, 18. We've just done 16. Read Isaiah 13 and 14 and Jeremiah 50, 51. And you'll see how God has foretold for, you know, since the beginning of time, the total destruction of Babylon. And these are just Babylon falling, Babylon falling. But all of these, all six of these chapters is just Babylon falling. So try and find 30 minutes. So at the end of each session, we track the meaning of the images. And so I've updated this to say chapters 15 and 16, where we had seven angels with seven bowls and seven plagues. So this is the end of episode 28, chapter 16. Seven bowls are poured out and it is done. And Revelation is the one book in the Bible that says, read me and be blessed. So blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. So thank you for spending this time with me. Please follow me to episode 29. God bless. Shalom. <laughs>